Hello, hello. My name is Christy Estrovitz with the San Francisco Public Library here in San Francisco, California on the Romatush land, on the unceded land of the Romatush Ohlone peoples. Wherever you're joining us from, we're glad you're with us for this very special Nature Boost with Kitty O'Mara and Luis Herrera. Nature Boost is a proud partnership with our library and our local national parks partners. That includes the Presidio Trust, the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and the National Park Service. For the past five years, we've been teaming up to bring nature experiences to our community. This has looked like, oh, shuttles, field, free field trips from our branches to our local national parks with guided hikes by rangers, ranger talks inside our libraries, story walks in the parks, and an ongoing series honoring the 50th anniversary of the occupation of Alcatraz and much more. With the onset of the pandemic, we had to do things a little differently. So we partnered up for an original programming virtual series to bring a weekly nature boost as part of our summer learning program. This was so well received that we decided to turn this into a monthly series, bringing a live, discussion or a virtual experience to a local national park and more to your screen. These programs like today are available on our YouTube channel anytime for your viewing. With that, I want to introduce our very special guest. Louise Herrera is our beloved and newly retired San Francisco Public Library City Librarian. He was at the helm at our agency when we began this partnership with our parks family. He currently serves as a board trustee with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, SF MoMA, and is a leader with the American Library Association with the Future of Libraries Committee. He's all, he was also appointed by President Obama to serve on the National Library Museum Board in 2012. As well, the same year, he was honored by Library Journal's Librarian of the Year. He's gonna be in conversation with Kitty O'Meara. She is the author made famous with her poem, And the People Stayed Home, which brought comfort to our screens, has been turned into, um, has been translated into dozens of languages, turned into a musical, is a viral hit. She's gonna be joining us from her home at the Full Moon Cottage near Madison, Wisconsin. She's a, a former teacher, a chaplain, a spiritual director. She has her master's in servant leadership. And we are so thrilled that she is bringing her new book to us today. I wanna share a quote, it's already receiving much praise. And this is from O, oh, the Oprah magazine. Kitty O'Meara is the poet laureate of the pandemic. The poem has become shorthand for silver linings perspective during the coronavirus, outbreak, and the hope that something good can come out of this collective state of together and apart. Before I turn this over, I want to just acknowledge our partners that are with us today to make this possible and invite you to our next Nature Boost, which is next week with um, Ranger Fatima. She's going to be sharing Ohlone Games, the game of staves, with permission from her peer from the Ohlone tribe. So I hope that you'll tune in for this. With that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Luis and Kitty for their conversation. Thank you very much, Christy. Delighted to be joining you. And Kitty, it's a pleasure to meet you. I want to start by letting you know or telling you that I really, really enjoyed the book and the people stayed home. You know, it started as a Thank you very poem. much. Yeah, it started as a poem, and poems really tell a story, and they evolve from sort of personal experiences and reflecting a life. So can you tell us about how the story began and what's behind the poem? Um, yes, I, I, I think I can and share some of that with you, Luis. It's... Um, it's a lot of the 65 years of my life that are in this little poem. Um, a lot of the things I believe and have prayed for in my, in, you know, my life and in the world. And they kind of were swirling around um, 
as my husband and I went into quarantine or lockdown um, in early March, uh, the end of February, right around then, um, we are both lovers of the earth. And we had been noticing articles uh, that were saying that even a few weeks in quarantine um, in Europe and other places in the world where the uh, pandemic had already put people into quarantine and lockdown, um, the earth was cleaning up and clearing up. The sky was clearing. The air quality was improving. Um, that heartened me. Um, and I thought as we went into quarantine with the panic, the fear, the anxiety, the worries that that brought with it, we could uh, look to these types of things and use the time to consider how when it was over, we could heal the earth more fully. Um, I, I have said that I, I didn't think that quarantine was going to reverse climate change, but I thought that these visible signs would inspire us. I also thought that the time in quarantine could be used to do things I've dedicated a lot of my life to, which uh, is art and learning and healing, um, the continual healing that humans do and that I as a chaplain and spiritual director have helped people do. Um, so all of that was kind of swirling around and I sat down one afternoon and just wrote it. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a lot of intentional uh, premeditated and edited writing. It was just kind of all of that coming out the way it chose to come out. And I posted it on Facebook. Um, and that night, a friend of mine in Albuquerque said, oh, I like this. Can I repost it? And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure. Um, and, th and that was that. It was no big wow. deal. Um, and then it became a big deal within wow. a few days. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? How it just goes viral and something that's powerful and moving can really make a difference. And, and I, you know, I love what you say about the power of healing and learning and all these uh, concepts sort of come together in, in this moment of crisis, right? Right, right. And certainly, they do. Go ahead. No, I agree. They do. A lot of things uh, become relevant that perhaps we hadn't had the time to make them before. And you receive so much global attention. It's amazing. Um, in fact, Deepak Chopra uh, was just full of praise. And I want to offer a quote. Uh, he says that you offer, quote, wisdom that can help during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. She is challenging us to grow to look inside, to listen deeply, and to allow ourselves to think differently, and ultimately to create new ways of living on the planet. Isn't it yeah. wonderful? What, what was it yeah. like to hear that kind of praise? Uh, well, his was among the first, and it was, uh, mm, I, I, I have to be honest and say initially it was overwhelming. Um, my husband and I were, you know, sitting in our living room and uh, he noticed that one of his former students had reposted it and we couldn't figure out how, what, what was, what had happened. And within hours, a friend uh, was uh, texting me that Deepak Chopra had made a video uh, of the poem. So it all, it all sort of cascaded at that point. And um I, I think it was only in retrospect that I appreciated his insight um, into what I I hoped my my little words could do. But I have to be honest and say, when I set them down, I I wasn't really sending them out into the world. I was just sharing them with a, a closed group of friends on Facebook, so that they did go global and viral and touch people. Uh, has been equally touching and humbling to me. Um, yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, though, because it resonated with the human heart yeah. and it touched yeah. people. So, yeah. I mean, even though it's it's personal, there's that universality that really, really went 
far and beyond, which is so exciting. Now then, how, yeah, and I, I think one of the reasons the is because the language is very simple. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons that people around the world took it in and translated it into their own languages. I also think people are yearning for a lot of the things that the poem addresses. And, you know, it was sort of unconsciously I wrote it and unconsciously it was received and resonating. And so then within a few days, I restarted a blog that I had stopped a few years ago. And that was the first post that I restarted it with and began to get these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. Um, and one of them was from an editor at Tra Publishing. And she wanted to uh, inquire whether I'd be interested in a children's book. And I thought that was perfect, having been a teacher and written things for children. So that's how the relationship started. And the book is the uh, co-creation of all those wonderful people and my own input. That's that's beautiful. So it went from that poem, and all of a sudden, there's that transition into the written word, the book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Right. So would you indulge us in reading the book? Oh, I'd be happy. No. I'd be happy to. I just, I I'd love to show the cover because I think it's beautiful, and I'm very proud of it. And uh, I I also want to before we get too far, um, I want to say that there's a wonderful website, and the people. St- and the people stayed home book.com. And it's got a lot of information and a wonderful teacher's guide. And I want to uh, let people know that that's available. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to read it and share it with you. And the people stayed home. I, I just want to go back to the end pages. Um, I was talking yesterday. Um, with your uh, editor and I I love the end pages because there's a, a picture on each page that matches one on the other and they're not in the same places. So it's really fun, I think, for children, but I gotta say I had a lot of fun too, just matching them up. So it's sort of an activity you can do before and after reading the book that I think extends it, makes it fun. Yes. <laughs> the dedication is to my husband, Philip. Um, and uh, I can't say enough good things about him. I love him to bits and pieces, and he makes everything possible for me. So uh, that's who, to whom the book is dedicated. And The People Stayed Home by Kitty O'Mara. It's illustrated by Stefano Di Cristo. Jafaro and Paul Pereira. And the people stayed home. And they listened and read books. and rested and exercised and made art and played games. And learned new ways of being and were still. And they listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced. Some met their shadows.
and the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses. and made new choices. And dream new images. And created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. That was lovely, Kitty. I love the pacing and the movement. It has this meditative quality about it. Uh, now, this is your first printed book, correct? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Um, the friend in Albuquerque that I had mentioned earlier had published two of my children's books. They were sort of middle grade novels, uh-huh. um, just as ebooks. And after a few years of very modest sales, <laughs> uh, we decided to just take them down. And so we did. So what was it like to sort of feel and get your hands on your first book? That must have been exhilarating. It was, yeah, oh, it was wonderful. It was very exciting. Meeting with the people at TRA was a gift from the get-go. Um, the co-creation of give and take among us was wonderful. It was life-giving. Um, and really, I, I, I can only call it blessing because I did nothing to deserve this. And it has occupied all the months that we've been in lockdown um, with just delight and fun and adventure. And uh, it's just been a complete gift. So you you just piqued my curiosity. So the poem itself took how long to write? 20 minutes? Wow. Maybe? Yeah. (laughs) Not... like the poems I post on my blog. Wow. Okay. And then the book itself from the concept to the actual time you got your hands on it was not too long, right? No. Uh, it, well, it started in April um, pretty quickly. And uh, I think I got a copy of my own uh, maybe two weeks ago. Um, wow. So well, it's, it's it was... Beautiful book. And, I, I, and first of all, the, the illustrations, they really complement the poem, right? And so I, tell, us, tell us about your team, your, your illustrative team. Um, well, so I worked with Andrea Burnett um, on promotion. Um, Andrea Gollin was the editor and uh, a, a real helpmate to me. Um, Stefano uh, De Cristofaro um, and Jeff Quintana did the, uh, I, Jeff I think would be called the art director and Stefano mm-hmm. did the illustrations and then later a gentleman, Paul Pareda, also assisted with the illustrations. Ilona Oppenheimer is the owner uh, of Tra Publishing, um, the manager the publisher, I I can't say enough good things about her 
and every single one of the people I mentioned, they, um, they were always upbeat. Um, there was, uh, there was no, um, there was no ego. It was all wow. sort of gift. Let's create this and give and take and talk about how I see it, how they see it. Um, and, and I think we agreed on a lot of things. I wanted, uh, just a rampant inclusivity. I wanted everyone that I could think of on earth to be represented and every age group. And I wanted cats and dogs and plants. And, you know, it, it, it was everything I hoped for. And um, I love, 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 love this book. I love the illustrations. Well, it's a spirit of collaboration is very evident. And the other thing that struck me was that it has this multinational multiculturalism embedded in there and so you know we love that and it definitely um transcends any one community so talk a little bit about that you know i know it's had that global connection yes well yeah so early on i was hearing from people um there were a lot of people from South America, um, and I, I think the uh, the rhythm perhaps um, appealed to them. Um, I, I I don't know. I um, barely speak Spanish, um, but I, I, there was something about the rhythm of this or the imagery that very much appealed um, to speakers of Spanish. But then I began to hear from uh, a lot of Asian, um, a gentleman who was most interested in getting it translated into several African languages, Wow. Um, mm-hmm, Eastern European, um, and then, you know, French and in a lot of, of Western Europe. Um, and again, like I said, I think I think we all knew uh things weren't going the way they could on our planet. Our gifts weren't being called forth to the degree they could be. Um, Climate change uh, could have been mitigated and could still be somewhat if we would pay attention to it. Um, And I think the virus itself was a uh, did not need to occur and certainly didn't need to spread. And I think we were feeling as a globe a, a great frustration uh, with with what inaction had brought. And I think we were also looking for hope. And my belief is not um, Pollyanna, although I always defend Pollyanna because she was sassy and spunky too, but but that of course we can do better. We can, we can join our gifts and we can do better. Uh, we can do different. Um, and, and I think that's what I strongly want to advocate. And I think that's what spoke to a lot of people because they agree. They agree with me. I agree, Kitty. And I speak Spanish. And to me, um, it had that inclusivity and it had a certain rhythm and that was beautiful. And I know you've you've had people, uh, get in touch with you because they want to uh, set music to it, whether it's jazz yes. or talk about that. Well, um, yeah, a lot of uh, composers, um, choral composers contacted me. Roger Ames created a piece, uh, the Gay Men's Choir, the Twin Cities Gay Men's Choir created a choral piece. Um, John Crigliano wanted to write a an aria for Renee Fleming. Um, oh. And, but a country Western singer from England created a beautiful piece. A lot of people wanted to create videos their own to go with the piece, and they did. Um, it's all over my, my website. I have a few posts that I, I tried to just dedicate to the people who shared with me. I know a lot of people didn't, and because it's all over, you can find them on YouTube and internet, and that's fine with me. That's beautiful. Um, I, I will say that uh, a kind of an interesting thing happened. Speaking again of Spanish speakers, um, there is a, a group called the Gabriel Alegria. I have to get all the words right. Gabriel Alegria Afro Peruvian Sextet. And they are a jazz group. They have been together for 15 years 
and gotten awards and recognition for their jazz. And uh, Gabriel had tried to reach me and uh, we have not great phone service. So I never got the message. And um, it came about two months later. One day I was out in the garden and I heard this plunk and all, all kinds of messages arrived that had been sent in the past couple months. And so I contacted him and he said, oh my gosh, we were just about to forget all about this. And uh, they wanted to use the poem for a piece on their new album. And uh, they wanted me to record it. So I said, okay, okay. And we did that. And then he said, and now would you record it in Spanish? And we'll put that the same piece, but with Spanish at the end, because the album is about social distancing. And we'd like those to be the beginning and end of the album. And uh, I said, yeah, no, uh, Gabriel, really not my wheelhouse. Uh, but I thought, okay, I remembered all those people who had contacted me and what they told me about the way this poem touched them. And I thought, you know what? I owe them this. I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> and I did. And then Gabriel contacted me. Uh, he, he sent me a recording of himself reciting it. He sent me the word. <laughs> I did it again. I did it again. And eventually we got, we got a piece that, um, that worked for them. And so that for me was uh, sort of a full circle from the beginning of the adventure, because I had heard from so many people who speak Spanish as their first language. Um, That's so that, that was. <laughs> That's terrific. So let's switch gears a little bit. You're, you're a okay. woman of new talents. And so you live in a place that's called the Full Moon Cottage in Madison, or outside Madison, Wisconsin. What's your daily life like? And how has it changed in life during the pandemic? Well, in prior years, I had been working a lot with a dog rescue. And um, uh, prior to that, our, we had two Border Collie labs for 13 years, and they had died. And we had adopted a new dog a rescue dog. And then I started working for this rescue and now we have five. So um, we have five dogs and three cats and uh, we're in lockdown, but we have about four acres here um, with a lot of gardens. And so with the space and the companionship and my husband and I are real good buddies. We talk a lot and share a lot and laugh a lot. So uh, it hasn't been hard other than the every other week trips to the grocery store because we live in a state and in a county in the state where mask wearing has not been always respected and so the caseload is rather high where we are so it's a little scary to head out to the grocery store but other than that and compared to many many people on the globe it we have been very grateful for our experience during this time. I love hearing yeah. about the love of, of canines, of dogs. Um, my wife and I have three rescues. And it's kind of ironic because the minute you started reading the, the poem, one of them came over and nestled right next to me. And it, it was either your soothing words or something, but I just found that so, so cute. Um, but that that's great uh, about and you've got five five dogs five rescues and three cats so that's that's fantastic surrounded by love yes very much and it does it keeps our days it kind of in routine in terms of you get up and you walk the dogs and you come in for a while and then you go out and play and then it's a little time for rest and then we go to the gardens and so our days have been very routinely filled and um you know, it's it's hard for me to find my writing time, but because of Philip, I'm able to do that. Oh, that's great. Oh, so, Kitty, one of my, two of my passions, libraries and parks. And um, I know Christy mentioned early on how we're just blessed in, in the Bay Area of having a wonderful partnership between parks and libraries uh, for learning. And mm -hmm. so... They're community partners, and we really see that connection. Uh, talk a little bit about nature. And I know this book is all about healing and the planet, but you also enjoy a lot of walks 
a lot of delving deep into nature. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what how that inspires you and the part? Yeah, that goes on? yeah, it, it's been a lifelong uh, source of uh, spiritual, deep, deep spiritual joy for me. Um, uh, I was raised Catholic. I taught in Catholic school. I attended Catholic school. So um, the the spirituality of the earth was sort of uh, taught and shared to me um, all the time I was growing up. And um, St. Francis uh, became uh, extremely important to my spiritual journey. And um, I think it's also just who I was, who my parents were as well. Um, especially my father was a gardener and had grew up on the, a lake in Minnesota. And uh, so it, it just was always very, very important to me to recognize that nature isn't a thing, that outside isn't a place, that it's us, that we are it. And uh, the, the, the communion that exists um, between myself and my trees and my flowers, and I say mine, those that I walk among and live among and, and tend as best I can, and who tend me in turn. It's all very important to me. Um, it's my church. Absolutely. So some of us sometimes, you know, we, we go out on a walk or um, make the time for that, but we really take it for granted and, and don't, stop and smell the roses as they say, right? So what would you, what hints would you give our audience, parents and children to really, really relish the moments and the time when they go out on nature trails and appreciate their surroundings? Yeah, well, um, I know that this is true of of uh, county parks and state parks everywhere that a lot of times there are rangers who will uh, serve as guides. Um, and it's, it's a matter of checking into that online, which is easy to do. Um, I think guided tours and walks can be so educational and they're often of course designed for families. Um, and so they're age appropriate in what they teach, but you learn about the plants, you learn about the birds, you learn about the codependency and the evolution of, say, a given trail or a park um, over the span of the four seasons. Um, I think that's invaluable. Um, you can do the reading. You know, there's so much available now online, uh, videos and YouTubes, and just create your own nature walk and go out and see what you can learn. Um, there are apps you can have on your phone that will identify also aspects mm -hmm. of what you're seeing around you. Um, it's okay. limitless. There's so much you can do and see and learn about um, and be respectful of as well. It's it's not about taking elements of that away from its habitat, um, but seeing it in its habitat and respecting how it uh, evolves and um, the interdependency of of the species um, is really I love that. important. And, you know, a little plug for what the national the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy is doing with Nature Boost because it really believes that um, parks are healthy. They really add to the, the what they call the Parks RX. Uh, it's a prescription uh -huh. for good health. And more and more studies are, are proving that to be the case. Mm -hmm. so they're working mm -hmm. really hard to make parks accessible to um, folks that are in urban communities that perhaps don't have that at the ready. The library mm -hmm. provides shuttles, as we talked about sometimes, to, to go out and really experience nature. But even within your confines, right? Talk a little bit mm -hmm. about what you can do at home for experiencing nature. I know we talked about the virtual and some of those virtual uh, tours. That's one thing. But yeah. What else would you suggest? Uh -huh. Well, a walk around your neighborhood, a walk in a park that's safe, of course, you know, do your masking, do your gloving and your social distancing. But there's still a lot of programs it, in my area that are open in parks uh, for uh, guiding yourself, the guided tours that are provided. Um, 
walking around the block and noticing the trees, um, seeing if you can figure out what they are, um, you know, planting a little garden. Uh, I did my first garden when I was eight. It doesn't have to be a big plot of earth. It can be a small little thing where you where you plant and tend and watch the cycle. You can have house plants and care for them. Um, you can, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty limitless. Um, we meditate outside. Um, families that do that can do that. Um, mm -hmm. Families that pray can pray outside. Families that just want to do a breath exercise outside. I think, you know, t learn about taking your pulse and, and uh, do it before you go out and then go out and do your breathing and take your pulse again and see what it does for you as a human being to be one with it. Um, study the weather. Look what the weather forecast is and then go outside and observe it. Study the stars and the movement of the sun and the moon. I mean, it's it's Wonderful. endless. <laughs> oh, terrific ideas. It's true. Uh, one in nature and, and to really uh, heal thyself, right? Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So as a child, um, were you an avid reader? And, and do you still... Oh, my read? Lord. You know what I did? I made... <laughs> I made a list for you of my favorite books oh, wow. and it just, it, it okay. went on and on and on. It went on and on and on. Favorite books. It, it's just so hard to, to say favorite in my life other than husband. I, it's just really hard to say favorite, but um, you know, uh, we moved a lot. My father's career, um, it was a corporate kind of military thing where you just, you moved a lot. And um Every time we moved, we would find the church and school and then the library. And then we'd start our weekly trips to the library and our, you know, big armloads of books. So reading, it was modeled in my home. There was always a New Yorker. There still is a New Yorker. So I've always had a copy of the New Yorker. There's always been stacks of books in every home I've lived in, starting with my parents. And uh, books are things to be proud of and happy to own and to cherish and take care of. And that we have public libraries, I don't think people understand what a miracle that is, what a, you know, uh, endless doorways that opens for a life. Um, yeah, I've always been a reader and I yep. am still a reader. Yeah. And you know, Kitty, every great writer has a strong connection to their library. So it doesn't oh, yeah. surprise me that you had that. <laughs> You know, um, you know, the love of books and going to your public library, that's, that's so great. And, you know, even during the time of pandemic, libraries have stepped up and provided mm -hmm. not only virtual programs and resources, but they're making a difference. They're working oh, hard. Very much. Um, all over the, the country to mm -hmm. really be a resource during these challenging times. So we should be very proud of our Libraries in we our should life. be very proud. And, and I want to thank you, Luis, for your life and dedication and the light mm -hmm. that you and Christy and Michelle and, and everyone have put in the world. Um, you are the wizards of my childhood, and I am very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. I love that term, thank wizards. You. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on now? What's your next big project, Kitty? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I want to bring this book out into the world and and do it justice. Um, it deserves that. Mm -hmm. um, I write poetry all the time, and occasionally I post it on the blog. And that poetry I do not write in 20 minutes. It's it it takes work for me to get it the way I want it. And even after I post it, I still putz around with it on my own. So um, that's keeping me quite busy. I have um, ideas for books that I'm thinking about, um, uh, but I really want to just uh, keep it simple. <laughs> so I was perusing the Daily Round, your blog, and I absolutely loved it. And you had a tribute to John Lewis. And you also had um, stories about I think you mentioned the angels and miracles and, and you have such a breadth of topics, uh, but the photography is phenomenal. So are you the photographer? Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh-huh. Wow. Yes. I enjoyed that very much. Um, 
you know, and I have friends uh, online and I mean, in my social circle, and one is a former student who are really photographers. I am an avid uh, amateur photographer, um, but I do enjoy it very much. And uh, a friend of mine who liked it many, many years ago said, you know, why don't you start a blog and do your writing and use your photographs? So I did. That's fantastic. So what's a preview of your next month's blog so we can have a scoop? Well, I, I just posted a poem yesterday that took me quite a while to write. Um, I don't know if it's quite finished, but it was finished enough. I'm one of those people that, you know, post it. It's, you know, it's you're not the poet laureate of the universe. Post the poem, get it out there, and then, you know, you can always tinker. So I did post one yesterday. And it was about um, the years of walking on the trail. And as I said to you earlier, it's kind of my church. So I uh, kind of kind of used a framework of uh, a liturgy. And I called it the liturgy of the trail. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of that poem. And it was about the walking with the dogs for 25 years on this trail. And... Uh, you know, oh, I would I, love to get my hands on that one. I'm going to look forward to reading that one. Okay, thank you. Good. Yeah, and I don't really plan too far ahead other than that. I, um, you know, I pay attention to what's happening outside, what I've got good pictures of. Uh, I try not to get too political, and that's hard for me, but I, I, I try to think of uh, hospitality and offering people a place to, to maybe ponder a few things, but but I try not to tell people how to ponder. <laughs> so, Kitty, right now, I mean, you're you're a former educator and a yes. lover of, of learning and teaching, and you know, parents. I I have to hand it to them; they are my heroes uh, that are um, serving as you know, teachers for kids that are, are learning from home. What, would you, what advice would you give parents that may be struggling with that, the, tra the transition? I know some have gone back to school, but some are still in a hybrid mode. Uh, there's yeah. disconnects. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's an important issue facing our country. In the world, really. I, I think so, too. And um, I, I don't want to um, in any way minimize what teachers do because I did it. But I also don't want parents to um, have this fear that their children will be lacking in any way if they are loved, if they are nourished with books and uh, attention. Uh, if they're invited to pursue things that interest them and guided in those pursuits, um, I think we, we will all be fine. This is an experience we're going through together, and it can teach us a lot of things about life and living that um, a year curriculum might not include. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think there should be panic I do think there should be moments when everybody shuts down all the machines, takes a breath, tells a story. I, I grew up in a family that told stories. Um, and I think that taught me a lot of things that I didn't learn in school. And I had wonderful teachers, but I think there are things we can use this time uh, to boost uh, and pad and enhance our learning. Um, all of us as as family members and people. So I really would tell parents um, to please, please don't don't be sad about what your children are missing because they're also gaining an opportunity that is richer in in ways than what could have been planned and offered and you know confined to third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. I think be expansive, be hopeful. Um, let go of being hard on yourself. Wonderful advice. And the other thing that stood out for me was it's a, it's a time for deep listening to one another. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's very important to me as a chaplain and spiritual director and teacher um, and just who I am. I think um, yeah, I'm talking a lot right now, but um, yes. 
um, as you are modeling, listening is uh, is key to so much of what happens in deep listening that, you know, where you listen to the person's mood and you listen to their choice of words and you listen to the way their eyes move and uh, their body uh, is held and their breathing occurs. When you listen to all those things and you ask uh, the questions that go deeper. Um, it, listening can do a lot of heavy lifting in relationship. That is so true, Kate. I'm a work in progress in terms of listening, but you learn so much more when you listen. And, you know, learning from you um, is, is part of this journey. So that, that's terrific. The other thing well, is... Well, and me from you, Louis. You know, the other thing is to have uh, children write in journal and put their experiences to paper. Is that a good idea? Oh, that's an excellent um, idea. I think any student I had would tell you that Ms. O uh, made us write. Lord, she made us write. Um, I, I thought that was an extremely important part of education. Um, and so I, I taught from literature itself. I taught from novels and poetry and myth and plays that I chose and selected. And since I uh, was uh, teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I could, uh, you know, I could choose themes and enhance them each of those three years and, and select novels and plays and poetry and everything that I thought went with it. But then there was writing and writing and writing and writing and writing that went with all of that too. And, you know, it, it can be interesting. It can be write a poem, listen to this, no, you write a poem or listen to this beginning and you write an ending or uh, in a paragraph, you know, with a beginning, middle and end so that, you know, we would call the, you know, a few paragraphs an essay. So they got the idea of how that worked. Um, endless, again, possibilities of the ways we can write and be invited to write, but I can't say enough about the power that that gives the child to master writing clearly and coherently and imaginatively. And certainly the, the reading connection is there. I know when uh, the library and the Golden Gate Parks Conservancy teamed up, one of the ideas was to have these story trails, story walks, so that as you're mm. walking the trails, you would have uh, pictures and stories. Sure. And so you would stop savor the moment, but also read the story. Mm. And, and what a wonderful connection. And those have been extremely, oh, yeah. extremely popular. Oh yeah, you got it all there. You got the words and the, and the walking and the nature and the story and oh Lord, the, it, that is perfect. Beautiful combination. Perfect. Mm. So Kitty, we're almost at the, the end of our conversation, but I, I really wanted to um, close by asking what advice you've received uh, from your audiences and you want to pass on to our audiences um, with your rich experiences. You've given us Gosh, a lot. Gosh, what, ad what advice I've received. Um, I, don't, I don't know that people have offered me a lot of advice. Um, their sharing of their stories has taught me, again, how important it is to be open and authentic. Um, I, you know, so indirectly, I would say that that was advice um, that I took to heart. Um, they've taught me, again, um, the value of humility, um, the awesome, awesome gift of people listening to your words. Um, the, uh, the modesty and innocence and uh, the truth with which they shared their, their stories. Um, you know, uh, I think sometimes as a writer, uh, any writer will do this, and I know I do too, is, you know, you try to fancy up things and uh, that paring down to the, you know, the green truth of things is so important. And I, I think I have learned that again. 
Well, Kitty, you have been a gift to all of us. And we so thank you for taking time to not only share your story, but also uh, to share the experience of this wonderful poem and now book that has resonated worldwide. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we look forward to much more in the future. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Christy Estrovitz. Christy. Thank you, Luis, thank you. It's been just a joy. Oh, I want to offer my thanks to both of you for this thoughtful conversation. I feel, I feel like I'm a, I'm renewed with hope right now for, mm. for our families, for our community, for our children. Um, Kitty, congratulations on um, this new book. Um, it is a gift to us all. Thank you so much. And Louise, thank you for joining us today and leading this conversation. Um, just a reminder that parks and public libraries are for everyone. They're free and available and accessible. And I hope that you visit your local library and your local parks as soon as possible. Thank you all for joining us today. And you can look for more public programming off the San Francisco Public Library YouTube page and look forward to more Nature Boost with our partners with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, the Presidio Trust, and the National Park Service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Thank you.